Okay, so uh, hopefully if, I'll, if you last and I last, by the end of the day, we cover three topics. Maybe we'll just cover two, depending on the interest. I'll see, I'll try to watch the, how your eyes are glazing over slowly over the day. Um, so this first topic uh, I, is, is basically a security topic. Right? And, uh, um, I think the previous days was mostly crypto. So maybe you, maybe this bores you to tears, or maybe this just uh, keeps you awake. You know. So um, this project, or this work, this the work that I'll describe here is uh, done in the context of uh, something called future internet architecture uh, research effort, which is a big uh, National Science Foundation uh, effort in the United States uh, to come up with some alternative or candidate next generation internet architectures. So keep that in mind, I'm not talking about today's reality, but some hypothetical world right? that may or may not happen. So um, we'll start with a overview of the internet today. This is just more, more for me than it is for you. Probably you know, you know, sure with how the internet works. And then I'll introduce you to this uh, one internet architecture, one candidate internet architecture called Name Data Networking. And then we'll uh, focus on security and privacy because I wish I could skip the introduction, but uh, talking about security and privacy is, you know, in a vacuum is impossible, right? So you have to understand the context. <clears throat> so, without further ado, so communication um, today is, uh, well, not today, but for, let's, let's say, most of the last 150 years, ever since uh, telegraph and telephone started uh, popping up in the world has been always a between endpoints. Right? The conversation between uh, endpoints, a wire connecting two devices, whether it's uh, physical layer devices or, or network layer routers, it's always a wire, uh, maybe a, a abstract wire like a wireless channel, but usually there's been a wire. Right? And um, this has been the case for a very long time. But uh, the web um, changed this and seeming, seemingly changed it forever. Right? There's no, there doesn't seem to be uh, any kind of fathomable reason of, of why the world would go back to um, the, old, the old model of, of wires. So what, what the web changed is gradually sort of, is, is the fact that uh, the content, data, information, has become the number one actor in today's communication. Rather than the endpoints or, or, the, or, the, or the resources that are located at the endpoints of communication, what has become the first class object is the information. Or I will use the word content. So information is more important than the place it comes from. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. You may not believe me, if you have questions, by the way, feel free to ask. You don't have to wait till the end. <coughs> so the paradigm shift has been this from the, you know, the, the old, uh, old style of manual switchboard operations to this kind of interconnection of, of, of seamless interconnection of huge numbers of routers um, and, and hosts and all kinds of other devices. Needless to say, uh, the internet has been an unexpected and uh, m monumental success story. And the reason uh, is, the reason that's still hard to uh, quantify. People, there's some like researchers in ethnography and et cetera, who are anthropology who are looking to quantify these reasons or discover these reasons, why it has been such a successful um, undertaking and why is it so popular. And there's no good agreement. Now, architecture of today's internet, as you probably know, has, is defined in um, basically two RFCs request internet requests for comments and both of them published in 1981 conceived in the late 70s that's right? so something that is fairly old this is TCP IP right architecture that is embodied in this in this um, RFCs it enables any host to talk to any other host right? as long as they speak that language right the protocols the minimum, fairly minimal protocols, they can talk to each other. Actually, 
it's not really host, it's more actually the interface, right? Network layer interface. They can talk to another network layer interface. So it supports end-to-end -end communication and provides famously unreliable uh, datagram or packet delivery um, by IP. And then to compensate for the simplicity of IP and its unreliable delivery, complexity is shifted to the endpoints where we have the uh, complicated beast of uh, TCP, okay, or less complicated UDP if you want uh, really minimal uh, reliability, okay. So if you took networking, you know, you probably spent some time trying to at least understand, maybe not even understanding, the TCP state diagram, right. This is all this complexity that compensates for unreliability of IP. So <coughs> Internetworking was uh, designed for the world of um, hardware resources, uh, peripherals, of expensive uh, mainframes and, and mini computers with uh, huge tape storage drives and uh, um, compute engines and all kinds of graphics uh, facilities, uh, expensive printers and scanners and etc. So this is the world of 1970s and early 80s where the the, the main reason for interconnection was resource sharing, okay? It was actually physical sharing of resources. Somebody had a supercomputer, you didn't have a supercomputer, you wanted to access it quickly, reliably over the internet. That was the chief reason for the creation of the internet, that sharing of resources. Not data. data Sharing of data was much later. So, surprisingly then, what it became is, 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 is the world of data that we have today. Today, very little communication over the internet involves sharing of uh, hard sort of physical resources. There is still some, but it's a tiny, uh, tiny fraction of, of, uh, of overall communication. So the funny thing is that the internet of yesterday helped create today's world of content. So it kind of brought it about. So clearly the, 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 the fluff of the World Wide Web would not have happened without the solid foundation that the internet, provi internet architecture provided. I say fluff because I actually mean fluff. You know. yeah, it's not, the World Wide Web did not really change all that much, did not intend to change the nature of communication, but it did. Uh, well, and that same world of content that the internet helped to, pre to create is actually kind of choking the internet today. And the reason it's choking it is because the internet wasn't designed for massive sharing of content. So, as you recall, I said that the communication model is point to point, a conversation or actually a sequence of packets because between two hosts or between two interfaces. And the central abstraction is a host identifier. Right, the something dot something, some dot something dot edu dot whatever. So, and that is translated to an IP address. There's one unique host name, one unique IP address. IP addresses means very, mean very little to us as humans. Host names mean a little more, but they don't have to be sens sensical. Many are not. So, in the last 15 years, we saw this global trend. Right, the, the, with the creation of HTTP and actually even before HTTP with, uh, if you're old enough, you might remember some weird little tools like Archie or Gopher f that preceded uh, HTTP, but they were all part of the same trend um, of information sharing. <clears throat> well, what, just to remind you, the beginning was things like email, FTP, and Telnet. Telnet was, or what we today refer to as secure shell, but back then was just telling that this was, was the number one um, means of communication. This, you use Telnet to access remote uh, hosts and run jobs and use their facilities. So this was all about sharing and then results were stored in files. So you transfer those files using FTP, which still exists. And then email, right? the famously unreliable store forward email that we still have today. And it's still, you know, it persists. It doesn't go away. But it's a very small percentage of communication. Today, we have enormous amounts of data that are being produced and consumed. I'm sure just people in this room produce and consume enormous amounts of data. Most of it is not very useful. 
Um, sorry, that's just a fact. You know. um, probably the data you read, most of it is not very useful. You only realize after you finished reading it. Um, data you produce, you know, all these important Facebook updates and all these really, really, really important Twitter messages and Instagram pictures. Um, maybe you don't produce them themselves, so I don't mean to insult anybody, but you know, your family members do, your pets do. Um, so there's tons of information that is everybody wants to read and et cetera, et cetera. So this information is not all sort of web-based. There is a lot of other stuff like audio and video conferencing, um, but uh, most of it is, is, is web-based web somehow. At the same time, another sort of obvious observation, the, device, the, the, the range of devices that are connected or connectable to the Internet has increased or broadened, right? So your, your light bulb can be on the internet, um, your, dog, uh, your dog's collar can be on the internet, right? You can actually get a, um, a dog collar or cat collar which has enough intelligence to have an IP address and so you can have a conversation with your dog. Um, you know, not to mention all kinds of PDAs, tablets, uh, sensors, actuators, etc. Uh, this, so here we have the increased heterogeneity of, of, of devices that are connected or connectable. I say connectable because they're not, they may not be always connected because of, we have this paradigm called DTN, Delay Tolerant Networking. Um, and communication has changed, not in just in the matter of what it is we're communicating, but, but what channels we're using, so increasingly wireless, and not just last hop wireless, but sometimes wireless intermediate hops with all kinds of uh, laser and other types of uh, wireless point-to-point com -point communication being used, plus mobility, plus ad hocness, all these, all, um, you know, the soup of uh, these uh, piffy little ex expressions, right? And um, of course the broadcast, which used to be present only in like, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago you saw broadcast in, in in, in, in the Ethernet. Right? That was pretty much it. Today, broadcast is intrinsic in many types of uh, communication media, including, of course, right here in this room, uh, with, the wire, um, with all kinds of 802 dot whatever protocols. Right? So, sorry, did I skip a slide? No. So, what we see is, is essentially a change between something which is a communication network a network that is designed for communicating to a network that is designed for distribution. Distribution of what? Data, content. Okay, so probably I'm telling you the obvious. If you don't believe me, ask me more. But that's, that's a view as a fact. So we have this situation where the nature of communication changed, but the underlying uh, protocols have not. So we have a distribution. Uh, we want to have. We want to use our current communication-centric network for the purposes of distribution, and that is not a good idea in the long run. Right? It's been. It's worked so far, but it's not a good idea. Right? And, and, and just to give you give you a, a brief overview of what how would they compare? What is the com con um, distribution network as opposed to a communication network. In a communication network, like in, like in today's and internet, and in the internet of 30 some years ago, you name endpoints of communication, right? Because communication is the number one um, paradigm. So communication, you name the endpoints, like hosts and interfaces. There's no memory in the network, right? The IP routers, the wires, they, they, we cannot we cannot treat them as having any kind of memory. There's no storage in the network. If there is, I mean, actually there is, de facto, there is, because when you, you send something, it's, it's being stored in the network, right? Even for the few, uh, maybe a hundred milliseconds that it's in transit, it's being stored in the network, but it, it is not visible. There's no, nothing explicit about it. You cannot address that storage. And security in a communication-centric network is all about the pipe, right? creating this sort of abstract pipe between two endpoints and securing that pipe. And stuff is good because it comes out of the right pipe. Right? So think like SSL, TLS type world. So you secure the process, the communication process, everything else should be easy. 
Well, we know better, of course. But in contrast, a distribution-centric network emphasizes content. And in that network, because content is, 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 is the first-class object, memory of the network becomes explicit. Right? If you want to facilitate efficient, sensible content distribution, scalable content distribution, your network has to have storage. It has to offer you memory for that information. And so that kind of blurs the boundary between storage and the wires. Okay? Maybe you'll see soon what I really mean by this. And so if communication itself is no longer the first, the number one priority, then what you have to secure is not the pipe, not the communication process, but rather secure the content, regardless of where it comes from, where it is being stored. Okay? So, let's step back a moment. So, whether you believe that content is taken over or not, it probably is a, is a different issue to convince you, and maybe, maybe I'll need to, that today's internet is kind of approaching the limits of its senescence. It's uh, kind of amazing that it lived that long. Uh, patches over time have tried to extend its uh, lifetime, and uh, well, it still works, but it isn't going to work well for too long. We compensate for the inadequacies of today's internet with all kinds of overlays and content distribution networks, CDNs, right? And if you know how those work, they basically tell you that the internet, that just the existence of CDNs, like um, to some extent Akamai, right? They are trying to compensate for the inadequacies of today's internet by patching it at a different, higher layer. And taking popular content for, for a fee and uh, distributing it to appropriate edges of the network so it can be served uh, quickly, uh, efficiently, etc. But that's a commercial service. Okay? It's not part of the internet. So, anyway, tons of people who know much more about networking, and I should admit I'm not, I used to be a long, long time ago a networking person, but I'm not anymore. Tons of people who know a lot about networking, than I, much more than I do, have decided that uh, it's time to mount an actual effort, a uh, large-scale effort, to try to do address the inadequacies, the, the, the current and emerging inadequacies of the, of the modern Internet by uh, designing from scratch, more or less, uh, a set of uh, candidate Internet architectures. Now, why, why a set? Why not one? Well, because, you know, what is the likelihood of replicating that synergy that existed 30-something uh, years ago when the first DARPA Internet was created. It was very small scale. There were probably a handful of researchers. Uh, actually, they weren't mostly researchers. They were mostly engineers. A handful of engineers that hammered out the, the, the backbone of today's Internet. There's no way this is going to happen today. Okay? Because just there are too many players, too many priorities. People aren't going to do it. So instead, the National Science Foundation <clears throat> Notice, no, the National Science Foundation, not DARPA, which was the DOD agency that helped actually helped create the original Internet, or funded it. It's NSF this time, says, okay, we're going to create this one-time program called Future Internet Architectures, and we're going to fund uh, some handful of efforts. Okay? Uh, we'll see. It's kind of a horse race, but it's not clear how many winners can be in it. Maybe none. So it's a funny horse race. And uh, this has uh, resulted in some five uh, projects, okay? And they're kind of approaching their, the end of their first funding phase. So they were funded about three years ago. And they're, so see, this mobility first. This is the internet architecture that emphasizes ad hocness and mobility, as the name suggests. And it is led by a team at Rutgers in, uh, in the U.S., right? And actually, they're all U.S.-based. National Science Foundation. Um, let's see, and um, all of them involve multiple universities, right? So just say led by Rutgers, but that has other, other people. XIA, which is Extensible Internet Architecture, that's a project uh, led by CMU, and in fact, it's, it has non CMU players, but it's largely within the family. 
And then NDN is the one I'm going to talk about, called Name Data Networking. Then there's something called ChoiceNet, which is, um, I don't remember who leads it, University of Kentucky or North Carolina State. Uh, it's a, also a larger team. It's funded later than others and out of some different pot of money. And then there's something called Nebula, which is led by uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania. Okay? So five large-scale efforts, all aiming to design the candidate next generation internet architecture and uh, essentially convince the, the rest, or convince the funders at least, that this is a viable architecture. They can support not only legacy type of communication, I, I emphasize that, because legacy type communication like uh, email and the same stupid telnet and FTP, they're not, they're not quite gone. They're like shingles, they just stay there, you know, kind of like linger in the blood, you know. They're not going not, not to go away. But they're certainly in, in the background in the background. So they have to support these kind of legacy applications and also support, presumably well, modern applications, right? Whatever they are, whatever the people who behind the project think they are, emerging also. Not clear what that word, mean, word means. Emerging applications. Okay, so again to recap the obvious, well not recap it, bring up the obvious, security and privacy of today's internet is not a big success story. Right? Internet is a great success. It certainly um, outlived its expectations and uh, exceeded all um, limits of people put on it. But uh, security and privacy is kind of a sad, sad tale. Because uh, there was none really designed for it in the beginning. There was no security and privacy. It was going to be uh, a small academic uh, DOD network and um, it was going to be used for uh, just a bunch of uh, eggheads to communicate uh, some weird stuff. Well, as time went by and uh, when the uh, first attacks started popping up and this abuse happened, uh, in, even in the very old sort of internet of 25 or so years ago when I was in grad school, um, people started talking about security, but uh, as we've seen, and if you studied internet protocols, you know that security has been a very and sort of unsatisfying uh, thing in, in, in today's internet. It's been applied, of course, retroactively and as a sort of a, a set of patches of dubious effectiveness. So things like the, the, the patches or the mandate style solutions I mean are like SSH, the SSL TLS, right, which was designed especially for web-like communication, and IPsec which was supposed to have been this very large band-aid that was going to secure everything, but hasn't done it. Um, so, not surprisingly, the people who are behind this future internet effort said, okay, well, for the next time around, you better, you better put security and privacy. Yeah, yeah, let's not forget privacy, because privacy was totally not important, even, even when modern internet security was being developed. So, built-in security and privacy from the, from the outset. Okay, so everybody, if you go to the meetings of these, where the people who are behind these projects present, everybody has tons of security and privacy information. You know, they, we, we love security, we love privacy. The truth is, uh, I think only one of the projects has like a cryptographer on it, and uh, a couple of them have security people, but that's about it. So it's not a very encouraging site. Uh, but, uh, so I'll, but I'll talk about my project, or for the project I'm, I'm part of, it's not mine. Um, suffice it to say that today these architectures are more or less solid and uh, security and privacy features are present in all of them. Right. So I'll talk about this one, Name Data Networking, and it's a collaboration of tons of entities, mostly universities, um, I'm at UC Irvine, and uh, the uh, lead is UCLA, uh, Lisha Zhang at UCLA, and um, sort of the, the person who is the brain behind the name data networking architecture that I'll describe is a guy named Van Jacobson, who you may have heard about in the context of TCP. So he's the one who's been playing around and developing TCP. That's his claim to fame. So there's a, like a list of people. 
Okay, so remember I, I, I claim there is like this fundamental difference between um, a communication network and distribution network. So let's go back to that for a bit. So, whoops, did I screw? Yeah. So, if you have IP, which is what we have today, and you try to do content distribution over IP, what's happened? What's going to happen, and what does happen, is something like this. You have some viral video on YouTube. Okay, something goes viral, it's not predictable, right? Because these things just uh, happen. Um, and then tons of people all over the world start requesting this viral video. And the internet re re responds like this. You have copies of that video that are being sent individually to whoever requests them. Now, if YouTube, of course, subscribes to Akamai or some other service, there is dissipation a bit of load, okay? But if they don't, right, they can also, YouTube could also replicate its, its uh, uh, servers, right, and, and sort of alleviate this, this bottleneck. But let's say it's not YouTube, but it's some small, relatively small website or some other service that has some content that goes viral. This is gonna, what, what happens, right? So you have this funnel effect, which is not nice. And this is what it, really does happen and has happened with even YouTube, which is a major entity, but when this uh, lady's videos some years ago hit the fan, uh, YouTube was uh, miffed because uh, they, they couldn't handle the volume. And this is a good example of what's wrong with, it, with, an, with, with using a communication network for the content distribution. So in a named data networking, NDN architecture, what happens in case of a video going viral is this. So imagine you still have YouTube and you still have these closely spaced or nearly simultaneous requests for content, for the same content, the same video, but now the network reacts gradually and as initial set of requests do come into YouTube, it serves them and then they settle in the caches of internet routers. Okay, so the major departure right away is that, you, uh, is that internet routers, which today are only about communication and routing, right? they route and forward, become places where you can store content. And so it helps you to think of it, imagine the content distribution network pushed down into the network layer and spread around the internet throughout its backbone rather than sitting on the edges. So this would result ideally in something like this where content is, is slowly or sort of grad, not slowly, gradually distributed and there is no funnel effect, there is no flood of requests coming into YouTube. Okay. So, there are some basic concepts here. In, the, in today's internet, you have a host and an interface. So, that all hosts and interfaces are more or less equal. It's kind of a generic uh, concept. Well, in NDN, you have a little richer uh, terminology. You have consumer, which is the entity that consumes content. Right? And you have a producer, because if there's Somebody consumes, somebody produces that content. Obviously, many consumers are also producers. Many producers are also consumers, but it's not required for a consumer to be a producer and the other way around. So, these are the entities and they're kind of in the foreground. Sorry, and they're kind of in the background, so I'll, you'll see why in a minute. The, the main entity is content. On the main abstraction is content. That is a piece of data. An MPEG file, a, um, a picture, a, a Twitter message, a Facebook uh, status update, anything, any unit of information can be thought of as content. Now, in order to get content, in order to ask for it, remember this is in the network layer, this is the backbone of the internet architecture, you have to uh, 
you have to ask for it, you request it using something called an interest. It's just terminology, right? It's interest is a kind of a packet that you say, I want this content. And you send a small interest that propagates through the internet somehow and makes it to the first or to the closest place that has a copy of that deser desired content. Okay, the, the devil is in the details. How do you ask for content? By name. Okay, so equally important is the concept of name, not address. Not address, I emphasize, not address. Not where it is, what it is. And what it is, is a name. And the way that NDN views it, name is just a human readable sequence of backslash separated components. Kind of like your, kind of not similar to a URL or a Unix path. Okay? Just components separated by well-known delimiters. Something you can actually read. Last but not least, cannot have an internet without routers. So the routers remain just like they are in the current internet. There are routers. In NDN, there are routers as well. They do pretty much what routers do today plus some. Okay? So they're a superset in, uh, of modern routers in terms of functionality. Just to contrast with IP, where IP you had a host, right? that was the main entity, and then you had an a host had one or more interfaces, but generally if you, if you wanted to be kosher about it, every interface of a physical host would have a different name, host name. Okay? And then the host name would have a corresponding IP address. And then instead of having interest and content, you had just datagrams. Everything was, is IP datagrams that have this... Uh, little header, right, with source address, destination address, a, con a kind of esoteric information uh, with it. And the router is also present in today's internet. Okay, so what is the name? This is the kind of a name I was talking about. So, starting from, it's, it's read in the non-Hebrew non way, right, from, from this way. So, it's this particular name refers to some uh, MPEG uh, widget file that resides, oh sorry, which resides, which has been created or produced somewhere at park.com. Right? Park.com being the entity, some, right? park. So, you can kind of look at it as a, as a sequence of, of uh, components, but also look at the, park.com is like a globally routable component. It just tells you really where it has been produced, not where, not where it is stored. Um, it has an organizational name and a conventional... Uh, in the end, I didn't, I didn't read it, but there could be something like versioning number and segment number because not all content can be thought of as just a mon monolithic thing. Uh, maybe if it's a movie file, it has um, chapters or frame, individual frames that you can um, refer to. And this is kind of convenient because you can encode it easily. You can just parse this kind of name, um, separated by slashes and encoded as a sequence of components. Now, just a pointer into the later in the talk, you can also refer by NDN name using its hash. So you can rattle out this whole name, and then you can append, if you know the hash of the content, you can append the hash. And so it becomes kind of like a self, it's a silly word, self-certifying name of sorts. Just keep that in mind. You can, you can do that. It's, not, it's, an, it's an option if you, if you happen to know the, the hash of the desired content. So, again, let's step, just to give you a contrast how IP works. IP works like this. You have a transport protocol, you have an IP uh, layer. Um, when um, a packet comes in, okay, it goes through a very simple set of procedures, IP packet today, right? It comes into some, on some interface, uh, checks is, is this destination me, if it is, goes to, up to the transport layer, if it's not, you decrement the time to live, to live, if it's zero, you throw it away. Assuming that the packet is otherwise fine, you then use the FIB, forwarding information base, that's a routing table to figure out where to send that packet next. Right? Then you use some prefix matching, longest prefix match um, on the IP address. 
and out it goes. Each packet is independent. There is no state kept that it relates to any kind of any packet. So the only state that routers are completely stateless except for routing information. Right? This forwarding information made. NDM works differently. So here we have a consumer and a producer. Right? A producer is the one that created content. Consumer is the one who wants a copy of that content. The consumer issues an interest. In that interest, he specifies a name, just as similar to what you've seen before. And that's pretty much it. Just says, I want this name. It doesn't say who I am, who, who is the requester, who is the, who is the consumer. It doesn't say anything about that. It's a kind of a desired and explicit privacy feature. Right? If you see somebody being interested, if you, if you look in the middle of the internet and you see a, an interest for some content, you don't know where it comes from. No one requested it. So, issues an interest, it goes to the next router. Again, routing is done on the basis of, of names. Just like today we have IP addresses and route is, uh, routing is done on the basis of the, those using pre, longest prefix match. In this world, routing is not diff, very different. You still use longest prefix match, but you don't use it on, a, on a fixed length IP addresses. You use it on a arbitrarily long names. So it goes to the first top router. The first top router says, OK, I'm going to forward it next towards the, um, this other place. And you see those little green boxes. That's the state information. So every router that forwards this interest has a, 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 a kind of a small, very fast cache where it keeps pending interests. Pending means it hasn't been served yet, hasn't been satisfied. So you see the green, it says leaves these little green pebbles in the routers that are on the way to the producer. Producer eventually receives it and replies. Okay? Replies with the actual content. So that content wipes out the green, little green boxes, right? So it removes that state from the pending interest table. But, you see, a copy of the content is cached. So every time any content that passes through a router, the router says, oh, well, let me cache it. Oh, do I have it? If I don't have it, let me cache it. Usually it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that I shouldn't even ask do I have it because the reason it forwarded the original interest is because it doesn't have it. So whenever content comes back, it caches it. So moves towards the original consumer. Consumer gets it. Now you have the situation where, say, and some, somebody else sometime later requests a copy of the same content, same name, right? So generates an interest. This goes to the nearest router, goes back to the next top router, but aha, uh -huh, here the next top router already has a copy of that content, so something very predictable happens, right? Doesn't go any further. So the router, the second top router, serves the desired content. And so this is the fundamental reason for um, efficient, a fundamental claim why this is an efficient means of content distribution. Right? Any number of re subsequent requests would be served uh, from uh, the closest router that has a cached copy of the desired content. Now, if you zoom in, what happens is this. Every router has something called a PIT, pending interest table. That's that fast cache, very temporary, very ephemeral. And every router has a content store. This is the actual cache that stored content. So when an interest comes in um, on interface 0 and is then forwarded to interface 2 because that's where the content is, fi is found. Um, if another, so this is a very key point. If, if, an, if one interest is currently pending and it came in, on, came in on interface 0, while that interest is pending, another interest for the same content can come in. This is what happens with popular content, right? News stories, viral videos, right? They can come in, the, the, the requests for the same content can come in very closely spaced. Okay, so while one interest is, is, being, is pending, another can come in. And what happens, it's collapsed. It's not forwarded. Okay, that's another reason why this is an efficient means of content distribution. 
Why is it not forwarded? Because, well, there's one already pending, so eventually if there's content that is being named, it's actually out there, that content will come back. And there's no reason to forward multiple requ redundant requests. Okay, so when the actual content comes back, it will be forwarded out, or let's just say multicasted, on as many interfaces that have requested it in the interim. Okay? So it's a very, very important point, this collapsing of interest. Okay, that I already said. Forwarding routing of pretty much an IP. This is actually a real thing. I'm going to... This part, uh, well, this part uh, of the lecture ends at 11, right? Or... Yeah, okay. So... so you want to play with the time, the risk of... Some flexibility, okay. Well, so there's actually a test bed that is today run as a partial overlay and partial native NDN that is mostly US centric, but there are some nodes starting to run in Europe. Um, before, I, before I go on to security, just wanted to remind you something maybe I showed you in a slide but haven't actually verbalized is that if you ever heard of something called content centric networking or information centric networking, ICN, CCN, this architecture is an example, an instantiation of, of, of that larger concept of information centric networking. Okay, so what about security? Well, again, today we secure the pipe due to the features of, of the modern, of the current internet. Data is considered authentic, correct, whatever, because it emanates from the right place, right? It's connected or comes out of the right pipe, uh, whether it's an IPsec tunnel or a SSL TLS tunnel. Now, in this world, is this new world or new imagined world of content, uh, security become and trust the properties of the content, not the place that stores or serves that content. Right? So if you recall the picture from the previous slide, uh, a couple of slides ago, uh, the router may store the content, but it doesn't produce it. Right? Just because the router serves the content and it comes from some router doesn't mean it had anything to do with producing that content. So what the key the keystone of security is content itself and its properties. So it can be retrieved anywhere, any place, and the only thing is important who produced it. Right? Its name pretty much tells you who produced it. Then the question becomes how can we trust that content? Well, the answer is very simple. Right? How we do know it's right, how, et cetera. So all the, all the good questions. The way that NDN addresses it is saying L content is signed. Okay? That's like the big bucket of cold water right? that we throw on this and say, okay, all content is signed. So now, if it's not signed, then it's not le legitimate content. Signed? No, signed means digitally signed, signed, you know, public key signature somewhere there, or some equivalent um, is found in every content. So part of this header, if you will, or, or part of the wrappings of every content is a signature. Right, and the signature, as you know, will give you things like integrity, provided, of course, it's based on the appropriate hash and sign uh, technique. Um, it tells you who the origin is, right? If you can actually, well, the signature itself doesn't necessarily tell you who the origin, but if you identify the appropriate public key and provide a sensible mapping from a public key to some entity, some identity string, it, you can derive the origin, so you can get origin authentication. Is it, it can give you correctness because if, if there is integrity in origin authentication, you can see that the name of the content, right? because remember, see, every content has name, right? and name is part of what is being signed, then you can see that, well, it's the same content that I asked for. So it, correctness can be obtained. And there's a bonus feature, well, again, this is the kind of the, 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 the advertisement for the architecture is that routers, if they choose to, right, uh, can verify content in transit. Now this is strange, right? So can you imagine internet routers verifying signatures? It's a bit of a, of a leap, right, from what the routers do today. But in principle, one could do this in this architecture. Okay, but the question is exactly how. Mechanically verifying a signature, hmm, 
one can probably imagine, but parsing public key certificates is not something routers should do. Now, clearly, one of the reasons uh, you wouldn't want to do this is because sign, well, verifying signatures, even the cheapest uh, digital signatures, are expensive. Signing is also expensive, but we don't care about signing as much because signing is only done by producers of content. Right? So this is one of those nice things. You produce content, you sign it, you do it somewhere, perhaps offline, at the edge, in some entity, some host, in some PDA, whatever the producer of the content is, but it's verified possibly many times. So as, as, as is the case in many, many security scenarios, the emphasis here is on the cost of verification, not really signing. Well, you can use all kinds of online, offline signatures and the standard sort of Swiss Army knife tricks with Merkle trees and probabilistic verification, all these naive things one can do. Some of them are helpful, some are not, but you can imagine routers doing that. What is not optional in NDN is that when you request content as a consumer, you must verify the signature. There is no option, right? So that you must, you must verify its signature when it arrives. Everybody else who handles content can choose to verify a signature, but it doesn't, is not obligated to. So, one natural question can, one can ask is, why create a new architecture? Why simply not take advantage of, of um, engineering advances, if you can call them that, of, of today's internet where security has been um, on, in the foreground for the last you know, 15 years at least and use something like IPsec or SSL and uh, just push them down to the network layer to this uh, NDN world? Well, again, this, the answer should be obvious because SSL, TLS and IPsec are co um, endpoint centric. They secure the, the, the communication channel between two hosts, two entities. Uh, what does that mean if you are requesting content and that content comes from the middle of the internet? because some router cached it. Does that mean you have to create an SSL TLS tunnel or IPsec tunnel before you can retrieve that content? So you can see that that does not fit. Right? If, if, remember our emphasis on content distribution. So the content can come from any place and uh, that means right before you even get that content you have to find out where it is, establish a secure pipe and then fetch it. That seems quite inefficient. So that, in a nutshell, is a reason for avoiding uh, existing solutions. The downside is that access control becomes difficult. Once content is retrieved from its producer, right, when it, once it emanates from the producer and settles in caches or uh, hosts or whatever, in the Internet, how can you control access to it? Today's world makes access control easier because you can just refuse connection, right? If you don't want somebody to connect to your website, you just refuse connection. You don't want them to fetch a certain web page. You, you, you create an account-based system where people have to log in and be authorized, etc. So we sweep that dust up to the upper layers. But in the end, if you know how to name something, if you know what it's named, you can get a copy. So how do you do access control? Well, that's, that's tough. So we have to resort to using encryption, just encrypting using access control by encryption, which has problems. So right away, I'm going to tell you that even though I'm a part of this project and I'm a fan, clearly, I mean, I participated in it for a number of years, and uh, in, especially in security and privacy, I am not enamored with all features of, of, of this. So for security purposes, access control is not, is not a strong point here. Uh, so, as I said, you can use encryption and the standard technique for access control, but one of the biggest uh, headaches is that uh, you have the burden of long-term security, right? If something is encrypted and it winds up in caches, well, sooner or later, encryption won't be good enough. In, you know, because as you all know, encryption doesn't age very well, right? It develops wrinkles, sometimes unexpectedly. So, the trust model is another kind of interesting thing is very laissez-faire, is uh, not, not uh, somehow specified, it's uh, left to, to the application, 
and says, well, if you want to use a hierarchical PKI, go ahead. If you want to use a peer-based uh, trust model, a la PGP, GPG, you can do that. Um, there's no specific trust hierarchy that is imposed. So one could imagine using today's web model, right, which comes like a multi-headed hedra of trust, right, these kind of multi different uh, roots of trust and you, you know, as long as we get our browsers from some secure place, we trust that these roots of trust are themselves trustworthy and that essentially gives us the genesis of our personal trust architecture in our browsers. So lots of questions regarding trust remain unanswered. We have answers, I just won't, I mean, as of recent, but I won't present them because it's sort of fairly new and untested work. So there is some progress on this, on this front. Um, there are some nice, some, some, some of them are unintended, uh, but some nice uh, privacy and security features of NDN that are just derivable from the basic features. So as I said, interests, right, these, these, these requests for content, they don't have a source or destination address. It should be clear to you by now that destination address makes no sense, right, because as long as you can say what you want, you don't care where it comes from, as long as it's accompanied by the right signature, right? And you can, and the trust issue is solved. So let's, let's assume, let's believe in that fairy tale for a moment. Um, so no reason to specify the destination address. There's no reason to specify a source address either. Maybe you know, you already see why. It's not actually a security or pri it's not a privacy choice. It is good for privacy, but it's not a privacy choice. The reason you don't need a source address is because of these little pebbles. You remember this picture with little green pebbles, right? The, the, this, where the interest propagates for a sequence of routers event until it encounters the copy of the closest copy of desired content. Well, guess what? Just like the picture said, the content hops back along, along exactly the same route that was established by these green pebbles. So it is guaranteed to come back to the place that requested it and there's no need for a source address. And that's a nice uh, privacy feature. You can see that somebody is interested in some document from park.com but you don't know who. Maybe you know which direction it comes from, right? Because if you, if you, if you observe an interest on a, on a wire between two routers, you know it came from that router but that's all you know. And the router itself doesn't know anymore. Again, it just knows the, the previous hop and the next hop. So that means the routing of content can be done without knowing who requests it, which is good. Moreover, if you recall this collapsing of interest, right, collapsing of this closely spaced interest, then you don't even know that the, whether the content that you are serving as a router, or that, so is it, as you, are you serving it as a result of one or many requests, and if many, how many? You have no idea. So even the producer of content, assuming that the interest propagates all the way to the producer, even that producer has no idea how many actual interests are there. Which makes certain things easy, which is good for privacy, right? But it's not always good for like accounting, right? If you want to know how popular your content is, you can't get it for free here. You have to resort to some tricks, okay? And let's see, okay, there's also router caching, right? So router caching is good for privacy because it removes the interest from, or prevents the interest from going throughout, through the internet. It basically just says, look, if, if there is a close copy of desired content nearby, that's where you're going to get it. So if somebody is observing some entity, some government is observing the, the backbone of the internet and is trying to derive um, information about traffic patterns from the, from the backbone, they're not going to get as much information as they do today. Right? Snooping is not going to be as effective because most requests for popular content will never enter the internet, the, the backbone anyway. They will never traverse it. At the same time, there are some challenges. So not everything is rosy. Uh, you can, by looking at the name of, of the content, right, whether, name, whether you observe an interest packet or a content packet, by looking at the name, 
which is by design human readable, you can infer a lot of things. This stuff was produced at uh, Playboy. This stuff was produced by, uh, I don't know, Mossad. And this stuff was an MP3 file. Or this stuff is... Uh, so, it's a rich, it's very expressive uh, syntax. Right? It tells you a lot about, of course, uh, this is just a pointer into the future, of course, nobody says that content names must be human readable. By design, there's an incentive for them to be human readable. But there's no requirement. Okay, so right away we can say, oh, well, maybe we can uh, encrypt or somehow uh, hide parts of, the, some of or take away some of that expressiveness for the sake of privacy. So stay tuned, that's coming up. You can't encrypt it all. That ought to be clear right now, right away, right? So you, you cannot take a name and encrypt all of it because that's meaningless. You cannot route encrypted names. That is, you cannot encrypt an IP address today and expect to route it, right, if you encrypt the destination. The only way you can use encryption if it's like point to point from routed from between two hops that share a key. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So, signatures actually aren't good for privacy. Not, not a surprise to, to, to any of you, I suppose, right? Signatures are great for security, terrible for privacy. One of those textbook examples in Security 101, we say, well, you know, that you tell students that, well, security and privacy are not the same thing and they're often in conflict with each other. And this is one of those great examples. Private, traditional digital signature will leak to you, well, in the very least, it will leak the public key. Right? You can at least verify a guess of a public key. Now, of course, there are all these exotic constructs like ring signatures and group signatures, but seriously, who is going to use those? Uh, in the near future and even on the next generation internet. And verification, well, partially because of uh, the setup and verification costs, etc. So, privacy of signatures is an issue. There is also cache privacy. The moment you have this nice feature, which is called the router cache, that becomes a very attractive fish pond for attacks. Uh, you'll see uh, down, uh, you know, down the line how that works. It's a, it's, a, it's a benefit on one hand, right, because the cache is what makes content distribution uh, effective and efficient, but that same feature is a privacy nightmare. So there is some recent and even ongoing work that I'm going to um, go through quickly. Um, the first thing is name privacy. The first thing we fo focused on was name privacy. That the fact that if you wanted the world not to know what you are really interested in, right, then how do you hide the name of the content that you want to fetch? As I already said, names are very expressive, they're meaningful, etc., etc., but they leak information. So you have a news, news item like this, you have a slash, and this is actually a better example of an Indian name than the one you saw before. So it's uh, slash NDN slash CNN slash world news dot China. Now, uh, obviously tells you what somebody is interested in. And this kind of a name, is, there may be a reason that somebody doesn't want to serve content. Let's say if you live in China and you ref issue an interest corresponding to that name, maybe some government entity will filter it out. Okay, so the question is how do you prevent names from being exposed? Well, remember the observation we made that, uh, or observation I made that uh, um, names are kind of supposed to be readable, but nobody's going to enforce the fact that they are readable. Routers, routers are not humans, right? They're not going to care if, if they can pronounce a name, or they just care to parse a name and split it into sequence of components and do some prefix uh, matching. So names are really opaque to the network. And routers just need to know how to parse the name, that is, how to establish the boundaries. And so, names can carry binary data, which means that we can play with uh, encrypting parts of the names, if not the entire thing. So this is the reason for, some, for this uh, tool we call Andana, which is an uh, anonymous name data networking application. And basically, just to give you a Reader's Digest version of what it is, it's, it's kind of like Tor. Okay? It's basically uh, an adaptation of Tor to this world of content. Now Tor, as you know, is designed for this low-lat 
right? Low latency, bidirectional communication. It's um, maybe some of you use it. It's not immediately obvious that you can map it into this world of content, right? because communication in NDN is not uh, two-way essentially, right? It's not natively two-way. So we'll see how we can do this. Uh, the goals are like this: that if you have observers that are close to the consumer, consumer the, the, the entity that requests content, then that uh, observer, oh, this observer should not learn about what content is being requested. And producers should not, of course, know who is requesting, but that's already a feature of NDN. So here, that's not a challenge. Okay? In today's IP, you need something like Tor with its tunneling because IP packets have source address and destination address. So actually, the, the, if, you, if you try to think of a today's IP and the producer of content, the producer of content would learn the source. That's not a problem with, the, with NDN, because interests don't carry source, uh, source address information. So we say producers may or may not be aware of this existence of this uh, tool, of this anonymization, but our main uh, subject, or the, the, the entities we want to protect, are the consumers. So how does it work? So you have a consumer here who uh, <coughs> has some, wants to uh, request some content from New York Times. I use a question mark to just abstract away the prefix. Okay, there's some kind of prefix. NDNs, US, media, New York Times, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but what he wants is really like a front page of New York Times. And he doesn't want anybody nearby, and there's supposed to be an adversary there, uh, to learn what that uh, content is. Okay, so like in Tor, there is this, we assume the existence of some onion routers. Okay, kind of like in Tor, they're like this overlay service, and uh, there's a directory of these onion routers, again, just like in Tor, and uh, the consumer will pick a couple of routers that it wants to use, they nothing to do with the topology of the network, nothing to do with fastest way to reach the producer, okay, nothing like that, just picks them at random and uh, says, okay, I'm going to essentially uh, envelop my request, like in Tor, in concentric layers of encryption. Well, except in Tor, you actually have to set up a circuit. Remember? Anybody here use Tor? A few people, okay. You have to actually set up a circuit. Here, there's no circuit to set up. Okay, because there's no long, there's no connection. Okay, there's going to be just request for content and response with the content itself. So all we care is that the same sequence of routers will forward the right content back, and that's it. There's no state that needs to be kept in the network after that. So there is only router one, only router two. And so what, what, the, what the consumer does is he, he basically encrypts the name that he wants once for the onion router two, the second hop, and then he encrypts it again for the onion router one. And you see there's the only thing that's visible in the light blue part is onion router two. Now it becomes clear in a second if it's not already. The only clear text part of the name that the, the, that the consumer is going to expose to the network is the prefix, whatever the prefix is, like slash world slash NDN, and then OR1. And what that means, interestingly enough, is that, you see, the, the, the blue stuff, well, the blue suffix of this name is gibberish. Right? It's some kind of random gibberish because we use, oh, whatever, OEP, OEP, blah, blah, blah. It's all random, so there's no way a name like that can be found in the network. There is no cached content corresponding to that name, right? What does that mean? That means we are guaranteed that whenever an interest is issued for a name like that, it's going to come all the way to OR1, who is the producer, the purported producer of the content that we want. But OR1 is a special overlay, right? It receives this uh, onion, whoops, sorry. Let's, let's play it again. It receives this, decrypts it, okay? So now what it sees is it says, oh, okay, well, I have an encrypted blob, but what I, what I really know is the prefix is slash NDN, slash whatever, slash OR2. So it just dutifully issues an interest for that name. And what does the network see? Whatever happens between OR1 and OR2, the network sees just that. It knows that there's some interest for content from OR2. Again, because the blue part is random, 
it cannot be found cached somewhere, so it's guaranteed to go all the way to R2, where it gets decrypted, and now you say, oh, okay, somebody wants New York Times front page. Cool. Goes to New York Times. New York Times has no idea that this, where this comes from, and even if it did, it doesn't know that it's the original request or an uh, anonymized request, okay? So it just serves the content. Okay, so now, whatever path that content took from New York Times to OR2, on that path, the New York Times homepage will be cached. So something kosher takes place, something that what NDN is supposed to do takes place. But now, the OR2 receives it and it wants to forward it to OR1, but it forwards it encrypted, right? Just like in Tor, you said it's derived keys. Every time a layer of encryption is removed from an interest, there's a key, so when the content comes back, you encrypt it. So we are abusing the network a little bit here because what, what's going to happen between OR2 and OR1, the routers, whatever they are, right? Because OR2 and OR1 could be on opposite ends of the internet. Whatever the routers in between, they're going to cache that encrypted, encrypted uh, content. But it's kind of useless. Right? I say kind of, it's not completely useless, but it's kind of useless because nobody else can request it. Right? It's encrypted. So the only one who could potentially benefit is that if it gets lost and it needs to be retransmitted. But cannot, it's, not, it's not really um, all that useful. But, so now R1 receives that encrypted content, super encrypts it again. Right? So now delivers it to the original consumer. And along all these segments between the R1 and consumer, OR2 and OR1, New York, there is this, still this interest establishment and the corresponding content hopping back and erasing that interest. So everything takes place, it's just that you have three segments instead of one direct. Okay? But the effect is very, very much like Tor. Okay? Except nothing lingers. There's no state that's kept. After, once the R1 or an R2 forward con encrypted content back towards where it came from, they have no idea where it came from, by the way. No idea. OR, OR2 doesn't know OR1. Okay, so then the consumer decrypts it or decrypts it twice. Okay, so again, due to the f main features of the architecture, it is Interesting to observe that the security of, sorry, the privacy obtained with this approach to onion routers is equivalent to Tor with three hops. That's kind of a trivial observation, and it is not due to our clever design. It's due to the feature of NDN that says interests do not have source addresses. Right? Maybe you can convince yourself that that's the case. Because it, the reason Tor, you need, three, you need three onion routers in Tor to get the same security because the first onion router knows the source. Okay? Well, here the first hop onion router, OR1, doesn't know the source. So that allows us to have fewer hops, obtain the same privacy, better efficiency. Okay? Uh, so, lower overhead. Now, that's uh, switch to cache privacy. I mentioned that's the other. Uh, kind of privacy nightmare um, in, uh, in NDN. This has to do with the fact that router caching was designed to be this wonderful feature. It provides better bandwidth utilization, right? So if you have these multiple requests for the same content, you, they benefit from the content potentially being in the cache already. Great. Therefore, lower latency, right? So not just that. These are separate orthogonal things. Better bandwidth utilization, and lower latency, right? Because content that is cached of course, comes from some close, some nearby place rather than from the producer who could be far away on, on, on the moon even, right? But it's bad for privacy. Oh, sorry. One other thing I should say is that caching is also good for retransmission. Right? It's not just multiple requests for the same content, but it's like if you only have one request but you, you have a lossy channel right, or error-prone error channel, then you can always take advantage of cache for privacy. So this is actually good, and, and this is not a security issue, but NDN also supports, not natively, but it supports uh, 
this kind of bidirectional communication, like just voice type calls, right? Or audio, video conferencing. And these are real time or close to real time type of communication. They're not easily mapped onto this content request response. But what's nice about the router caching is that if you have errors, let's say you're, you're talking on the cell phone or something, you, know, you have a, a lossy channel, you can take advantage of cache for purposes of retransmission. So, right, your retransmission requests don't need to go all the way to the other party, they can be. Um, you know, satisfied from the network. Okay, so, but caching is terrible for privacy because of timing attacks, okay? And what's called cache harvesting. Cache harvesting is a, is a esoteric feature that can be easily disabled. I'm not going to spend time on it, but timing is an important uh, uh, problem. So, let's first see who could be the adversary here. So, the adversary is, uh, let's say, another host or a router. Uh, it could also be a malicious application because uh, in NDN, like an IP, you, if you have a host or some device, it can run many network applications and they will share the same cache. Right? When I said, by the way, routers cache content, all NDN, I, I, I made a mistake, all NDN entities cache content. So there's really, in some ways, no distinction as far as caching between routers and, and endpoints. All entities that speak NDN have a cache. The size can vary. Even the existence of a cache can be kind of choked, it can be very small, but they can all cache content. All right. So the adversary could be near the consumer. So then the adversary would try to figure out whether consumer is requesting certain content. The adversary could be near the producer and is trying to figure out whether somebody is requesting content from a given producer. Or it could be in both places at once. And the reason that that kind of adversary is well, relevant is if the adversary is near the producer, near the consumer, and the consumer and producer are actually having a two-way conversation, the adversary could somehow establish, try to establish that they are indeed talking. So here's one, one scenario. It's very obvious. You have a consumer who, let's say, issued an interest for some content. It hopped, 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 hopped through the internet, fetched from the producer or whatever, and hops back. Okay, now notice the first hop router has cached, let's say, this content. NDN, org, WikiLeaks, blah, 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 okay? Now, the adversary who is somewhere near the consumer, or let's say near doesn't really matter, he shares the same first hop router with the consumer, with the, with the victim. And then he wants to confirm his guess that somebody recently, somebody presumably this victim, has recently requested this content. It's easy to do, right? You just issue an interest for the same content. I say, wait a minute, so time it, time it. Is it coming from a first stop router or not? It's easy to tell. If it's coming from a first stop router, then somebody near me has requested it. And if I'm sitting in a Starbucks and it's empty, except for my intended victim, right? And I've been here sitting here for a while and I want to see if I can verify my guess of whatever content she requested, I can do this. Right? Because it will be served very quickly. And I can certainly tell the difference between serve, something served very quickly from a nearby router and something served from world away from WikiLeaks in Iceland or whatever the heck they are or where. Um, okay, now if I want to instead uh, snoop on the, on the producer and see if he's trying to communicate, I could um, request a certain content, right? I, I guess, oh, somebody has asked this producer for this name, for this content, with this name. So let me ask for it, okay? Now the reason you see the, that adversary is located on the other side of the router is because if it was on the same side, then if you asked for the producer's content, it would go to the actual producer directly. It wouldn't go for any routers. Okay, so it wouldn't help him mount this attack. He has to be on the other side, and so he's asking for the content, and if the router serves the content immediately, then it's in the cache, that means somebody requested it, if, router doesn't, if, if, if the adversary times here, the timing has to be a little more precise. The adversary times it, oh, it's been at least two hops. That means it actually comes from the producer, and that means nobody has requested it recently. It's not in the cache. So the, these are not pleasant. Right? The, something that's supposed to be of, of benefit that's being abused for um, 
sort of uh, against privacy. And so you, there's a generalization of this where you can have the adversaries in both places at once. One of the things I forgot to say is that, of course, there's this notion of public keys, right? Because there are signatures, there is an, there's an explicit notion of public keys. And in fact, NDN, although, again, I underline, does not have a trust model, it does have a notion of public key containers or certificates. And public keys are treated as any other content. They are signed, like any other content. So signed content, and if the signed content is a public key, well, it's a kind of a certificate. And then if the signed content, it could be self-signed or it could be whatever, so, but keys are content. And so before two parties can actually communicate securely, they, they are expected to fetch each other's public key. So before, let's say, I, before I uh, request a homepage from, say, New York Times, if, I'm, if I want to do it securely, I should first fetch the public key corresponding to New York Times. Now, it's possible the public key could be embedded in the, in the home page and I could actually get, get the whole package all in once, or I could request it individually. And so one way for the adversary to play with privacy here is he could see if, if he can ask, for, let's say he's on the side of Alice and he asks for Bob's public key. And if Bob's public key comes from a nearby router, that means somebody has ta been talking to Bob recently. If at the same time he asks a router next to Bob for Alice's public key and it comes back quickly, then he'll know that with some high probability Alice and Bob have been talking or are still talking. Uh, this, uh, I'll just skip this in the interest of time. So interesting, well, the more interesting part is, so what do we do about it? Is this, uh, is this a real uh, nightmare? We just learned to live with it, which just seems to be a high price to pay uh, for conveniences of NDN, or do we do something about it? So one solution, kind of throwing a baby out with the bathwater, is not to do caching. You can turn it off. Actually, NDN allows you to turn it off. It says you should cache, but doesn't tell you how big the cache is. So you could just say, oh, I have a cache of size zero. Okay, don't cache. Uh, but uh, that kind of kills uh, the joy. Right? Um, the main uh, reason for its existence, or one of the main reasons, is the fact that the caching provides efficient content distribution. So bad idea. Now, I should also say that these timing attacks are clearly more effective the closer you are to actual victims. If you start using these timing attacks on routers that are far away from, from victims, right? Uh, if, if, if the adversary is trying to attack Alice and by timing requests from a router which is not the first hop router but is like five hops away, that's useless, right? The adversary is not going to succeed because there are so many potential consumers that could have requested content that passed through that router. Right? There's, doesn't scale. This attack doesn't scale. It has to be somewhere near the intended victim. But still, that not caching is not good. Well, so what can we do? We can cache and delay. One way to think about it is, that, well, you know, if, if this is particularly sensitive content, not all content is sensitive, but if, if there's sensitive content, perhaps uh, Alice, when she requests some content, could say, you know, I'm worried about privacy. And what that means that the router, that consumer-facing router, will still cache uh, the co that content, but it would not serve it immediately on subsequent requests. So if an adversary or just any other person asks for that same content again, the router will sit there and uh, play with its thumbs. For how long? For as long as the original content to, to come back. The original content may have come back from some other router or from the actual producer of that content. The router in question doesn't know, but it knows how long it took, right? From the time it forwarded the original interest to the time the content came back, it knows the time, the round trip time. It says, well, if there are any subsequent requests, I'm going to be waiting, I'm going to delay them. It's not the cure-all solution, but it's a reasonable solution because it says now the, ad the adversary cannot tell the difference between uh, content that has been served from the router's cache and a content that has actually been fetched from somewhere else. But can you do this forever? Well, you can do this forever and that gives you better privacy or you can do it for some k subsequent requests. Well, k is not, shouldn't be fixed by some picked uniformly at random from some range, from some reasonably small range. And so that's one sort of engineering approach is to say, well, 
let's pick some k, and for the k subsequent requests for the same content, we are going to delay them artificially. And then, after that, we're going to start serving them quickly. So the idea is the adversary doesn't know k, then uh, the adversary won't know whether his own requests brought the content into the router, or whether the content has already existed cached in the router. There is another approach, again, another sort of slightly less baby with the bathwater, but another approach is to let consumers say, do not cache. Right? To put a flag and say, well, the consumer request, let's say WikiLeaks document, it will put a flag in the interest saying, do not cache the corresponding content. So that seems actually like a simpler and more effective idea, right? If you, it's not cached, then you cannot probe it. The problem is that consumer selfishness. People will just put do not cache on everything. Right? Just because, oh, it costs me nothing. It's no skin of my nose. If I put do not cache, I'll get what I want. I don't care about anybody else. So, human experience of a millennia tells us that people will probably do exactly that. So, um, we need something a little, a little, a little, a little more uh, complicated, though. Like, uh, like, like the um, delaying K, K subsequent requests. Okay. Um, actually, this is not applicable to all types of traffic. Um, what I just described is, is, is an approach to uh, address ca cache privacy problem with this typical kind of content, requesting popular content, right? Like WikiLeaks page or New York Times page. Something that people know how to, is, is sort of fairly public, supposed to be uh, consumed by multitudes of, uh, of consumers. But there are also types of communication like two-way, low latency, right? Interactive video chat, a, Sky, a Skype type call, where you don't expect uh, cache probing, right? You don't expect multiple consumers to ask from two different, right? Two different, you don't expect two different entities to ask for the next voice packet that is from a conversation between two hosts, right? And it's an interactive traffic, so it's not content distribution traffic. So for that, there's a very simple solution that says, look, uh, whenever two, they have a, a bidirectional low latency communication, you can assume that the two parties can agree on, a, on some secret. Okay? And every name, every content, so how, how would it work? Basically, the Skype call in NDN would be like this. Uh, Alice would request an interest asking Bob for his next, next voice packet. Bob will send the voice packet, and at the same time, he'll request Alice's next voice packet. Okay, which is, how do you request? Well, you need an NDNM, like slash something, slash something, slash something, Alice, slash whatever, Skype, slash voice packet number five, whatever that means. Now, if you can append to that name as a suffix some random unique component, which is derived like some, using some PRF from the common secret, that solves everything. The reason it does is because if a router receives a content that has an unpredictable, like, like with Andana, some unpredictable uh, part, doesn't matter if it's prefix, suffix, or whatever, but in this case it's just a suffix, then nobody who doesn't know the secret can ask for that. So the, the privacy feature here is in the name itself. Okay? So we don't have to worry about delaying of uh, voice traffic, for example, that is done by just naming them appropriately. So, just to sum up on, on, on the cache privacy issue in, in NDN, remember we have two approaches. One is for this uh, synchronous or bidirectional traffic, uh, or more, more, more low latency communication, or syn you know, um, near real time, where the idea is to the caching or hostile, hostile cache probing can be avoided by using unpredictable names. So the idea is you don't know the name, you cannot ask for it. Okay? And then for more distribution traffic, uh, that uh, the names are not uh, secret, but traffic is, uh, or content is uh, uh, intended for wide dissemination. If you want privacy, then you use this uh, uh, delaying approach. Right? Now, the delaying approach clearly uh, kills one of the advantages of caching, which is efficient, sorry, uh, um, latency, right? Which is, which is good latency. But it doesn't kill other two advantages of caching, which is efficient bandwidth utilization. 
right? You, we still utilize as much bandwidth as with regular caching, which is good. And the other one is error um, sort of uh, recovery, right? The lost packet recovery, error recovery. So you can still uh, benefit from caching here. Right, and so how do we do this, uh, at least in, in, in the content distribution part, right? It's e easy. The, the, the first part with low latency communication, we don't have to involve routers or anything. I just producer and consumer, if they're having a conversation, can just use these kind of unpredictable names. N routers don't care. They are oblivious. But what about uh, the, the idea of delaying um, or uh, addressing the hostile probing? So there, it's clear, I think, that routers must be involved. There's no way to avoid router, router involvement. <clears throat> and how would the routers know when to do this? They could, of course, do it for all content, but that's not, that's not good, right? Because not all content is private. Not everybody cares about privacy. So there should be an option not to have it and not delay. Um, so um, we, have, we have to somehow indicate to the routers that certain content is private. So who would tell the routers that content is private? Maybe in some perfect world, routers could clairvoyantly infer that uh, content should be private. Okay? Uh, not a good approach, right? How, how does the dumb router know the context? He doesn't know who requested the content. How, he, how could, the router know, could the router know whether it's private? The producer of content, right? That, that, that's a sensible approach. Well, whoever produced content might have an idea that this is maybe, I don't know, uh, WikiLeaks or Playboy, that they know that, uh, you know, they, every content has this privacy bit. Easy enough for those examples. Not so easy for others, like if you're doing, I don't know, CNN uh, China thing and you are asking for it within China, well, <laughs> it it's maybe ought to be treated with privacy depending on where the, where the request comes from. Right? So the same content might not be uh, at all private you know, for most of the world, but some places with oppressive regimes uh, asking for that content should be done with privacy. So that brings us logically into this, uh, the only pos other possibility, which is the, 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 the consumer should be the one uh, that says, this is, I want this with privacy. Okay, so that means we introduce a kind of a bit in the interest that says this is a being requested with privacy. Okay, and then the rest is more or less easy. That, there are some details here that are not, uh, that are a bit subtle, but uh, I'll skip them. So, the, there are a few other topics here, but I'll, I'll, again, I'll skip most of them because it's just too, I don't want to spend too much time and I want to go on to the next uh, lecture component. I do want to say something about denial of service. So, so denial of service is a big scourge of the internet today, right? The, especially distributed denial of service, everybody knows about it. Um, the good news is that, given that you, you all seemed awake, you know, and uh, alert during the first part, uh, so you, you know that uh, certain types of denial of service attacks are just not applicable to NDN. Which is great. It's all good reason to jump up and down and feel happy. Of course, this would be stupid, right? Just to say, well, today's internet has attacks like this, and our design is resistant to those attacks. That's, that's moronic, right? Because obviously, the, the adversaries will adapt like this. They'll adapt before everybody else does, and they'll design new, exciting denial of service attacks, right? So just saying, oh, our architecture is immune to today's attacks, that's stupid. But I'll still just to be stupid for a minute, I'll tell you, well, of course, you cannot do the same kinds of things that you can do today. How do you attack a host, right? Today's internet, if you know the host name, IP address, you can send packets. That's the beauty of it. You send packets. If you send one packet, you can send a million packets. You don't have to send them from the same place. You get bots from all over the world sending packets to a particular host. It seems at the first glance that this kind of an attack will not work against NDN. Be why? Because, well, remember that picture with Susan Boyle and YouTube video, right? You tried to do that by requesting content, and then the content will settle in routers, and interest will be collapsed, and things sh should work, and the attacks should essentially dissipate, or the effects of the attack would be very low or small, but that's only at the first glance. 
because if you really, really zoom into the way MDN works, you can still attack the producer. You might not know where the producer is. Although the name like park.com and newyorktimes.com might tell you what entity is, 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 is the target here. But you can attack them. And the way you can attack them is by abusing the naming uh, feature. Instead of issuing an interest for something like slash world slash NDN slash YouTube slash latest viral video, you could simply use that and then append a random number. Guess what happens? Again, this is like before, I, I suggested using random numbers earlier as a means of preventing cash probing attacks. Now let's turn the tables. Random numbers can be used to reliably reach the producer. Because if you append a random number at the end of the name, and names are elastic right, and flexible, you are guaranteed to reach the producer. Because obviously that content has not been cached. It has a random component. Excellent. What better way to attack? Just append random numbers. So that's uh, just telling you that, okay, the adversary just needs to adapt to the new architecture and, and denial of service becomes uh, reasonably easy. Now, uh, but th what this slide is telling you is that, uh, of course, if the adversary is dumb, and okay, there are some dumb adversaries, they will ask for predictable names and then, of course, interest will be collapsed and uh, the attack will not work. There are some other attacks, more general attacks, that do not aim to flood a particular target. Because just like today's internet, if, I, if, if a, a bot of zombies is trying to attack a specific autonomous system, right, a domain or, or a host, you can try to react to that attack by maybe signaling to the routers to throttle to throttle traffic that is going to a certain destination. Right? There are tons of techniques and gazillions of papers that have been written about this stuff, how to throttle, trace back, blah, blah, blah. Most of it is not implemented, but some ad hoc throttling can be done and is done on the internet today, when, whenever the denial of service attacks take place. But there is a more interesting, more general attack, which is called interest flooding. And interest flooding is essentially a, is an attack that aims to take advantage of the fact that routers cache interest. Remember, they also cache content. But while the interest, for a short time that the interest is being satisfied, right? The, the network is looking for the closest copy of the content. The routers that process the interest keep state. And so, if you manage to overwhelm routers with arbitrary, spurious, interests, you consume a precious resource that prevents others from legitimately using the network. And that's called interest flooding attack. Okay, and it's a very cheap attack to mount and it's very difficult, well, it's, it's kind of difficult to throttle because there are no source addresses on interest, so you can only throttle kind of piecemeal. Not, not easy to address it and it's quite effective because if someone wants to overwhelm a router with these spurious uh, interests, they do not have to put related names in interest, right? All the, they can just generate arbitrary names that at least start with some sensible prefix and flood the router with, such, with, with interest expressing those names. There's no way the router can correlate the such interests because they have very little in common. So that's why it's a very nice attack, effective. Um, the other type is content or cache poisoning. Now, oh sorry, I, I, I've got a little bit too far. So I did miss the ones in black in the beginning. This is loopholing or black holing attacks that are possible on today's internet through, through routing, right? These are kind of routing attacks. This, suffice it to say, these same, the same types of attacks are not possible in NDN. Because loops, right? Remember, because a router keeps track of what interests it has seen, loops are not possible. Okay? A router that forwards and let's say receives a packet on interest X, 
sorry, I'm, receives an interest on interface X and forwards that interest on interface Y, distinct from X, can never receive an interest for the same content on the interface Y. You see, that's impossible. If it does, there's something wrong. Right? It just received from X, forwarded on Y, while in waiting for content, cannot receive an interest on Y for the same content. I impossible. So that's, and so loops are impossible, right? At least they're, they're detectable immediately, right? Unlike today's internet. That's good. Now interest flooding, and then router resource exhaustion, that's possible. It's another uh, attack on routers that essentially if routers verify signatures. Now you can send content. Now, I did say, I think, and if I didn't, I apologize, there is no security on interests. Right? Remember I said that interests don't carry source address, so as surely advanced security people, you already probably figured out that if there is no source, there is no security. Right? Because how do you secure an interest if you don't know who sent it? So there's no security on interest, no, no integrity, no no nothing. Content, yes. Interest, no. And that's why interest flooding is an effective attack. Now, if you're thinking, well, isn't it just trivial to introduce security for interest? Sign them. Well, signing means what? That de facto I would be adding a source address to interest. Very nice. Privacy goes out in the window. Maybe that's not a problem. Let's go on with this fairy tale. If we sign interest, Wait a minute, somebody has to verify them. Content has to be verified by the consumer, optionally by routers. But interests are processed by routers, therefore they would have to verify. That opens the door for a huge, huge denial of service problem. By trying to fix denial of service, we are creating a bigger one. Very bad idea. So that's the reason, a kind of a reductio ad absurdum, interests should remain insecure. Because making them secure creates a bigger problem than it solves. Okay, now, you cannot flood a router with content. That is a nice feature of NDN. You cannot ask, even if a router, even if you know that a router uh, verifies signatures on content, maybe you know, it's an option, you cannot flood that router with content. That's a statement of fact. And the fact is based on very simple observation that in order to receive content or process content, the router must have something in its pending interest table that says, I'm expecting this content. Right? So you cannot flood unilaterally a router with, with unwanted content because the router will only expect content that for which it has previously processed an interest. Now, interest for incoming content throw it out immediately. So <clears throat> that doesn't mean that a router cannot be flooded with a little bit of content because if there is a bad malicious router upstream, that malicious router could reply with bad content based on whatever pending interest. But that's a limited amount of content. Also the assumption here is that the malicious router. So that's a good, that's a good feature. However, what is possible is that last bullet, which is what's called content or cache. What? How does that work? That's not the same thing as flooding, right? Content flooding is just crude, raw, flood the router with content. Doesn't work. Content poisoning is more kind of fine attack, more fine-grained attack. It says, I'm going to introduce poisoned content, or fake content, into the network. How do I do it? One way is reactive. I, as an adversary, occupy some position in the network, preferably somewhere in the backbone. And whenever I hear interest for some content, I reply with fake content. Now let's be realistic. Under what circumstances can an attack like this occur? It can occur only if the adversary essentially compromises a backbone router or just one, some one or more routers. That's a pretty high bar. But notice, even in this case, 
the bad content can only be served in response to actual interests that emanate from actual consumers. Now, if we make the attacker model a little stronger, then what the attacker could do is actually forget compromising routers, but he could actually inject his own interests into the network and then populate, res uh, respond to his own interests. So basically, it's a, it's a kind of a proactive attack. The, uh, the attacker, let's say, anticipates a run on YouTube for some viral video and anticipating that, he says he issues a bunch of interests from a bunch of zombies throughout the internet and responds to those interests with his own fake copies of the content of that viral video. Fake. Then when the real wave of requests can start coming in, the network serves cached copies of poisoned or vi you know, fake content. That's a problem. I mean, still, the bar is not very low for this kind of an attack, but it's quite possible and it doesn't take a, 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 a state-level entity to mount that kind of an attack. So it's the real worry. And this attack is actually, um, uh, the ability to, 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 to fight this attack is predicated on a trust architecture. Because how does a router, well, let me see if I have a slide, I'm trying to remember. Why is it DDoS? Well, good, good question. Um, why DDoS? Because, for an attack like that to be effective, the requests, the interest for fake content must come from disparate places so that the fake content settles in as many caches throughout the internet as possible for maximum effect. Right? You want to essentially make sure that when the genuine interests come in, on the wave of that interest come in, they do not propagate to the actual producer or as few as possible propagate to the actual producer. Right? And instead, that fake content that is already settled in, in router caches will be served to unsuspecting consumers. Now, clearly, as I said a couple of times, consumers will verify the signatures on, on the content they request and they will discover that this is fake. Fake because it's the wrong public key or because the signature doesn't verify, whatever. They'll, but the question now is, what do they do about it? Right. So what do they do? So let's so hold on for a second. So I already covered this. I think that's interest flooding. Uh, ah, okay. So back to interest flooding. How do we fight it? Well, there is no really satisfying way, as with most denial of service attacks. There is no like foolproof, silver bullet, bullet like method of fighting denial of service attack. Right? You can limit or throttle incoming interest rate. It sounds like banking, right? But it's really interest rate or rate of incoming interest. You can throttle it and say, well, you know what? A lot of crap, or crap means interest that do not, that do not get satisfied. Because again, one of the things I didn't mention explicitly, but probably you can, you've already figured out, is that not all interests are satisfied. An interest for a given content comes into the router, it put into the pit, pending interest table, eventually will time out if no content comes back. So for attacks like interest flooding where some random number is appended to the end, there's no error message. NDN does not have an error message from the producer that says no such content. Instead, the producer just doesn't reply. He says, I received a non-sensical interest, I, I, throw, I throw it away. So it doesn't reply. So there's no way to infer for a router that this is interest flooding or this is uh, just something that doesn't exist, an error. That's one of the fundamental problems is with denial of services. You cannot just figure it out with this kind of denial of service. You can't figure out whether this is a hostile packet or a benign packet with a, referring to non-existent or erroneous content. So throttling and saying, well, you know, I have been getting a lot of interest from interface that have, not been, that have not been satisfied. So I'm going to li co uh, rate limit it. It's not very well, satisfying, but that's one way. And routers can do it unilaterally or they can do it in a collaborative fashion and there are all kinds of trade-offs that will probably bore you to tears if I go into any more detail. But I do, I do want to point out one thing, that error 
Attempting to correct this problem, address this problem by error messages is a horrible idea. And the reason it's a horrible idea is because, is a, again, security 101. Whenever you introduce error messages, you have to ask the question, what about security of error messages? Who checks? Right? If you don't have security, error messages themselves become denial of service. And um, if you secure error messages, then it's another kind of denial of service because now somebody can flood you with error messages that will make you verify signatures on error messages. So basically error messages are a nightmare any way you deal with them, whether they're secured or not. It doesn't solve anything. Um, so this is the, a, a more a sort of zoom, a zooming into the content poisoning scenario, right? The second one is the is a more proactive setting that I described, where the adversary anticipates demand for content and pre-populates caches with junk. Right? So, again, we are in this very uh, unpleasant state. We say, well, how do we counter this denial of service? We could do it by verifying signatures in routers. Great. That itself is a denial of service. Again, so we, by trying to solve the problem with con point and co uh, content poisoning, we can solve it. But then routers will do nothing but verify signatures. So that's not good. What about feedback? What if consumer? Remember I said consumers must always verify signatures. But we already discussed. If consumers start complaining to routers that, oh, I received bad content, how do they complain? Uh, error messages? Didn't we just cover error messages? So, not a good idea. Right? So, consumers complaining to routers is a very bad idea. Plus, if they complain, I mean, it's already a bad idea for, for many reasons. Another bad reason, another reason to avoid them is that con complaining about content is itself a denial of service attack because a consumer who wants certain content to be flushed from a router cache will complain about it and say, this is bad. And the router will say, well, you know, I don't have time to verify signature, but I'll trust you, I'll flush it. So that's not, not good. So there is no silver bullet, but we have something. And maybe next time if you run into me or you somewhere, I'll tell you a, a little bit of a story of how to do this. There is a way to do it, um, but it requires addressing this trust architecture. Because actually these two issues, the content poisoning and trust architecture, are very, very related. Okay. So I'm going to skip this part because that's a little more esoteric. That's, this is the, the part of the talk that deals with how to use NDN in settings that are not about content. Not, not traditional dissemination settings, but rather uh, environments like sensing and actuation. So just to give you a brief tour, here we, talk, we actually focused on, on, on a special case of like instrument environment, like lighting in a building like this. So you know these lighting systems are increasingly uh, IP-based today. Right? Yeah, they actually they use uh, wireless 802, 802.something, and they, uh, they even can receive updates, uh, software updates or firmware updates over the air, some of them. Okay? So in the past, they were all, all, all completely isolated uh, systems, f completely um, shut off from the real world, but today they're like appliances, they're connectable to the internet. Uh, the question is if you have uh, an environment where you, you know, say actuation, right? So lighting is actuation more than sensing. Right? Because you need to turn on lights, dim lights, and especially we, we use this in the context of uh, theater lighting. Theater lighting is much more complicated than, you know, if you haven't worked in, with this, it's much more complicated than you'd imagine. And much more complicated than lighting in a place like this. Because you need very fine grained control and the devices are very sophisticated. So, uh, how would you work in it? Well, it turns out you need to invert the way that NDN works because there's no content. Uh, forget the slides, maybe I'll just talk for a couple of minutes. If, if I want to tell a light switch to turn itself on, well, it's not exactly content distribution here, right? So we kind of had to contort NDN and NDN security in order to satisfy this environment. And we showed that it's possible. Um, it's not exactly trivial, so how does, let's say, a controller or a, a person, a manager, let's say a guy with a laptop, tell 
who has the permission to uh, has the, the rights to access a switch tell the light to dim itself or to or to turn itself off okay or for start blinking well that's an actuation command so if if we go strictly with NDN model you should be saying to the light the light doesn't know that somebody wants to turn it, it on so you have to express an interest for the light to get a command from you then the light would issue an interest to get a command from you you provide content which is the command which is long, boring, and inefficient. So instead what we do is say, okay, actually a command to the light is an interest for the light to turn itself on or off or whatever. Okay, might make sense? Should make sense, right? It's a short command. Usually commands to the actuating uh, equipment or the actuating devices are simple. Turn itself off. Turn the volume down. Uh, you know, start spraying water or whatever, whatever the actuation is. But the problem is, if we use interests as a means of command or actuation, we have no security because interests have no security, right? They don't say where the interest comes from and they don't say who produced it, right? There's nothing, there's nothing in it by design. So we have to adapt and essentially, again, abuse the name right? by introducing, let's say, a signature or a, or a, or a Mac into the, one of the components of the name so that the, the, the light switch or whatever the actuation equipment that receives a command, which is an interest, can actually authenticate it and figure out who it was issued by, then turn itself on and return content, which is its status. Oh, okay, I'm on. Or I've, I've done what you wanted. Or no, you have no right. Something like that. So that's in a nutshell what we do here. So I'll skip this. Sensing is a little different because sensing is not like actuation, right? Actuation is all control. Sensing is essentially like querying a database, right? So it's a little bit different. Uh, I'll skip the routing. We have also some work on like how to secure in the end in the context of like audio conferencing, participatory sensing, etc. And I think last slide for this part of talk. This is a large grain of salt. This is an expression, maybe you've heard it. Take what I say with a large grain of salt because what I described is work in progress. All right, it is an internet architecture that is not, not set in stone. Um, we have addressed some security and privacy headaches. We examined the architecture for pitfalls of various sorts, but some new, our new problems are still here and we explore uh, how to mitigate them. The very same statement applies to all other uh, candidate internet architecture projects. I don't care if you hear otherwise, I claim they all have very so, sort of similar growing pains, fundamental headache, uh, security uh, privacy headaches. Uh, but the most challenging issue by far is the issue of trust management. I you know for, for crypto people, trust management might sound a bit totally nebulous. For security people, uh, this is, tends to press a button like, oh, you're talking about like some PKI, or you're talking about uh, this. No, it's just what forms the fundamental um, layer for establishing trust, for verifying content, right? Because everything here is based on some, the existence of some trust model. And NDN does not have a clear trust model. Not that, well, it didn't have one until very recently, but I'm not ready to talk about it just yet. Okay, but it is the most challenging issue for all. Here are a couple of references. This is a bit egotistical or self-centric here. The, there are a few other results that I forgot to mention here on this list um, that deal with various aspects of this. So the general NDN project overview can be found on the web. There is a, there's a big website on it. The architecture is in, the third item is the actual kind of architecture, basic architecture explained. And then the last uh, five, Papers listed here are essentially what I, what I talked about uh, today in, in the context of security and privacy. Okay, so unless there are further questions, I'll move on. No, I don't want to sound like it. Are there further questions? Okay, and then I'll move on to the part two.